So the first time we do a talk on notable failures and the room is full. <laughs> I'm not sure what that says. Either you're way more optimistic or less optimistic than I am. So thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, just before we just get started, I'd like to provide a little bit of a Canadian content warning. Uh, I'm going to be actually a little bit polite here. I'm, despite some of the temptation, I'm not going to specifically name names about recent companies or past companies that have failed. I think they've gone through enough as it is. Instead, I'd like to look forward and hopefully give people a bit of suggestions from my perspective on how to avoid some really common challenges, and particular challenges we see prevalent within robotics companies. And just to get some housekeeping out of the way, it's the it's a new thing that we're starting here with major talks is these are my formal affiliations for anyone who's particularly interested. But if I look at informal affiliations or affiliations that go back a long way, uh, this is me when I was 20 years old. Um, some of you have seen pictures like this. This was the first, the first deployment of Kiva systems ever. And one of the things that, we've, uh, that really inspired the creation of ClearPath Robotics and later on Automotors it was the belief that more and more people were going to accept and encourage and demand robotics and autonomous systems use around the world. And that we thought that Kiva was just going to be a bellwether of that. And it turns out we were fairly right about that. In particular, these are large robotics investments, history over the last 10 years. And by large, we mean the only investments which are counted on this graph are investments of greater than $50 million US per transaction. That's a lot of money. And that's probably why we're all talking here, why we're all sitting here today, as we're all excited, or in this particular room at least, as we're excited about all this potential for robotics investments. But at the same time, we're looking at recent news of, of many recent robotics darlings, which are just say things are not going so well for them. And, there's possibly people in this room who are wondering, what's the difference? How can, do I want to be part of this? I, how can I avoid some of these situations? So there's three topics. There's three topics I'd like to really cover here. First, the robotics decathlon. Second, finding practical and prob profitable problems. And third, what exactly is this competitive advantage that people talk about all the time? So with that, and I'm feeling kind of awkward here. Normally I'd walk around the stage, but the AV guys have told me I can't, and apparently our research is good enough to do self-driving cars, but not enough to point a camera at me. All right, so if a startup is a marathon, a robotic startup is a decathlon. This is a statement I really like. Uh, Phil Duffy, I'm not sure if he's in the audience. He's, I believe he's working with BrainCorp right now, but I really, really like this statement. For anyone who's worked in a startup, robotic startups are worse. <laughs> They're like you took all the hard parts of software companies, hardware companies, services companies, manufacturing companies, and all sorts of other organizations, and you rolled them all together into one sort of concentrated core of stress. That's really what running a robotics company is all about. And to put that in perspective, this is a little bit of recent data from, from our company, from our organization as a whole. This, this slice is the amount of people at our company who have a background, a academic background in robotics. This small slice, our autonomous systems developers or autonomy engineers as we call them. Then we broaden that out to engineering in general, we're about a third of the company. Now you've got, maybe you've got a product. And then to actually have a company, this is really what we're talking about here. We're talking about everything else. And if you're really looking to create and run a company and take this forward, most of the time you should be making the assumption that you have to learn a little bit of everything here. Because there's no one else. You're, you're the one who's hiring these roles. You're the one who's evaluating these people, who's guiding them, who's directing them, who may, if things don't go so well, who may have to fire them. And it's not just, it's not just the robot side of things. The robot side of things, the research, the algorithms, this is the smallest percentage. And honestly, for me, it's one of the things that takes the least amount of my time. Not because I don't like it, it's one of my favorite parts of the job, but because it's something I'm comfortable with. It's everything else here that really makes it a challenge. Going into this, this is what really makes it a decathlon, is that every one of these challenges 
brings new, uh, new and exciting and really just fun experiences. And then we have another challenge which comes forth, and I'll say this one is particularly prevalent for robotics, roboticists. I'm not, I'm not quite sure why. Uh, could you raise your hand if you've used the phrase a general approach or a generalization? Just raise your hand. Yeah, there, that's, that's everybody, thanks. Um, yeah, a general approach for X, a platform for Y. Um, this is actually backed up by IEEE. It's a thousand papers, recent papers with robotics papers that quote a general approach or a generalization. And this is something, I, I don't see software companies doing this as much. I don't see, I, I advise some space tech, which is a thing, space tech companies. They don't confuse uh, running satellites with launching rockets. They're different companies, they know that. But in robotics, we don't seem to, and I'm not sure why. But here's, here's a really good example. Um, let's, let's take this description, this general description. A high performance database capable of describing and searching a graph of relationships at a global scale. So I'd like every one of you to think of a company that you think best embodies this. And raise your hand if you thought Facebook. Some, okay, LinkedIn. Some others, and WeChat, right? They're all the same. They all really do embody this. But at no point do we really think that Facebook can immediately pivot from being what Facebook is to being WeChat, or that WeChat can immediately be LinkedIn or that Facebook can immediately be you know, Google Plus, if that's still around. Um, but for some reason in robotics, we think that this is okay. We think that we can build a general slam approach, which academically we might be able to, but that usually, that doesn't survive first contact with the industry. I just, the last time I had this conversation was about this uh, company making this mistake was literally an hour ago. Um, and this, this is just very common, and we seem to really love it, but this is my, this is my big cautionary measure, that really, in the end, we're a gen we have a general approach, or we're a platform company. This, this isn't a cheat code to skip customer discovery and product management. It's really not. I don't blame you, it's not fun, but it's not a cheat code. And now, around this time, Usually everyone looks and says, well, what about the App Store? Aren't they making tons of money? Well, and yes, the App Stores are making tons of money. Annualized, that's about, about um, $80 billion US per year, just purely on apps. That's a, a wonderful thing which, you know, the, the Apple people who absolutely not, are not in this audience and the Waymo crowds, you know, this is, like, this is what you have to thank for being able to work on fun toys. But, this isn't really, you can't just jump from nothing to platform company. If we look at actually the history, the, the most, most popular, most, arguably most successful platform and app company in the world is Apple when they released the iPhone in June, two, June 2007. But what many people don't realize is that the next thing they did wasn't release the App Store, it was sell 5.5 million phones. And only after that did they launch the App Store. They had 5.5 million, I believe at the time they were called Jesus phones, in people's hands. No, look it up, it's, it was news coverage. Um, in, in people's hands, and only then did they launch the platform. And how many robotics companies have you seen out there saying, well, the first thing we're gonna be is we're gonna be a platform for developers to develop our application. Well, what that's saying is you haven't actually talked to customers, you're just hoping that someone else around the world is gonna fix that problem for you but even the most successful business in the world didn't do that. So really, on the software you software people, keep, keep this one in mind. And then, far be it from me to leave the, the hardware folks off the hook. I'd like to thank Randall Monroe for putting this better than I ever could. In case you can't read, the bottom, uh, the bottom state where there is it could help with search and rescue is just engineers speak for we needed a justification for our cool robot. And now I know many of you have done this before. It's okay to admit it because your grant reviewers are not here. And it's also not meant to bash cool robots. I mean, at ClearPath, I think it was 2011, we had one of our robots tow a fueled 737 aircraft as a system characterization exercise. 
I'm sure there are easier ways to do it, but they just, they were not as awesome. But let's, let us really focus on what are these practical and profitable problems. Now around this time, people say things like, you shouldn't be, you're not a robotics company. You, you may have robots, but you're not a robotics company. And you, you have statements like this, you know, Kiva is not a robotics company. Hi, Ian, if you're in the room. Um, it, it's a solution provider that uses robots. Or RTAC is not a robotics company. That's only a small part of what we do. All these people have gone the other way and they're saying we're not a robotics company. Well, you're here. So let's, let's look at a few different other new companies coming up here. We have Iron Ox, a new company. I'm not exactly sure where you're out of. Um, but a new, a new company where you're looking at greenhouses. You're looking at indoor farming. Well, this is great, it is a farming company, but it's also very clearly a robotics company. And at the same time, this is another new, uh, new company recently founded, Built Robotics, construction automation. And this, this is shot, like this is a construction video. But at the same time, it's okay to say these are robotics companies. And I think what's important as, you, as you're looking to get investment, to, to scale, to recruit, to sell, is realize that you can be all of these at the same time. Don't lose sight of the fact that you're a robotics company, but also just don't lose sight of the fact that you need to be something else. So to use our example, ClearPath is a robotics company, but we're also a materials handling company. We're also an industrial automation company. We're an open source supporter. We're a research tools provider. We're a process design company, and we have a pretty cool patio. Um, but it's okay to be more than one of these things as long as you're aware of the full spectrum of things that you probably have to be. Right? Like Walmart's a store, but they also have the most effective supply chain on the face of this planet, and that's the reason why they're effective and why they're profitable. It's not because of the stellar decor in the inside of their stores. But really, even ignoring this, like just skip over this thing entirely, look at what the value chain is. Has anyone heard the term value chain? Could you raise your hand just so I know how to calibrate? Oh good, a bunch of people have. Excellent, so let's break this thing down for those people who haven't. Um, our value chain, we pay money and we get parts of that and then what we do is we sell robots and get money. That's basically our value chain. Um, it's fairly simple. Um, and if you find, if you see statements like, you know, at you know, Facebook or Google, the users are the product, well you can, you can express yourselves in value chains too. But let's look at some recent failures, actually from about, about five, ten years ago, this was a little bit more common, where you have the, the rise of 3D perception and 3D mapping, where you have software, which these researchers were able to create, and they wanted to receive money for this software and for these algorithms. And then on the other side, you had people, and, you wanted to and they wanted to receive products. And the general thought was that you could develop with this incredibly accurate 3D perception technology and 3D mapping technology, you could map or you could develop products which were able to get you things like customized, customized clothes, customized hats, customized glasses, um, made to fit shoes or furniture and all of these things like that. But really, this is the question. It's kind of, you know, in the middle there's a question mark and somehow profit comes out of this. And it's important to realize that there's, there's gotta be something that ties this together. We can't just, there's, there are cases where researchers get, they, they start up a company and they say, I have this software and then three days later, corporate development comes knocking and then you get acquired and it's all wonderful and you buy a Tesla. But most of the time, that's really not what happens. So really, let's use another example. This one is a, a recent and Canadian example where we have similar uh, mapping technology and a uh, mining and then what the mining company wants is they want to pay money for certain sort of standard reports. And then you have a company who is developed, who has realized that this is what needs to be done, so they're bu building the software, but they're also putting in the work to translate it into these standard reports, to understand what these mining companies actually want to see. And they've, they've done the entire thing. They're not leaving it to chance. They're not leaving it to, to use the, the clothes example they're not leaving this to Hugo Boss to at some point say, you know what we need? We need a 3D scanner to scan suits and we're just gonna give them a bunch of money to do so. And that's gonna happen in the next six months before this small company runs out of money. But no, they've taken that step. 
And then if you don't do that, you get into a certain set of failure modes. Um, the first is that there's no value proposition whatsoever. Um, so social robotics in general seems to be going through a bit of challenge in the last year or so. And really what you have here is many of these companies identified as being social robotics companies. They didn't really say what else they were. They didn't really say what other parts of the value chain were they, were they doing, what value could they bring to me that my all-seeing Echo or Google Home couldn't actually bring to me for a tenth the price. They didn't really articulate this. They didn't understand it and they said, first, they didn't know where they were in the value chain and second, they identified themselves as only this, we're a social robotics company and social robotics is gonna be the next wave. And I do believe that social robotics has a very powerful place to play in, in future society, but we need to be able to explain it to people and it needs to be able to stand on its own as more than just buy this because it's a robot. Then we have the perpetual pilot purgatory. I'm including this, this company not because they're an example of a company that's fallen into it, but more because they're an example of advanced technology which is actually doing a good job of staying out of it. This is Exxon, Exxon Technologies, a spinoff from UPenn, the Grasp Lab, and they've, they build autonomous, autonomous quadcopters and related technology, and they've done a bunch of demos to mining companies. And what they've done, what they're starting to do a really good job at is not only selling cool technology to these mining companies, but following up and understanding and validating that they're actually bringing value. Because one of the things that I have seen time and again, for, and for anyone who wants to sell in, in the business to business market, is large businesses will buy cool toys, will buy one of every cool toy that's on the market and it's not really a good indication that you actually built something great. It's an indication that some research manager has a really, really good expense account. That's mostly what it means. The measure of success when you're selling to business, to, like to larger businesses, is when you sell multiples. Um, it's a big difference. Like I know 100 grand for a robot or a quarter million dollars for a robot is a really great sale, but honestly, some of these companies, like mining companies, have millions of dollars. Construction companies have millions and billions of dollars to spend on these gambles. And the really important thing is once you've convinced them to buy that first piece of cool tech that you've got, follow up and understand that your hypothesis of the value you're bringing is actually there. And that you're doing more than, that you're doing more than just offering an autonomous vehicle in this particular area, but that you're able to speak their language. And in general, this is, this is brought up here, uh, this, this article here, this is actually from modern materials handling because this is something that we're actually seeing very commonly in the materials handling space, which is where automotors tends to spend a lot of our time, where we're seeing many, many companies which are building these single vehicles without realizing that it's more than just being a robotics company. And what's the story for service and integration? And are you actually demonstrating their value? I mean, recently, we had some of our systems featured on earnings calls from major Fortune 50 companies. And when a Fortune 50 company says, we are going to succeed in the market because we're incorporating this stuff in an official earnings call, that's a really good sign. Uh, when they bought a single robot, like we, for many, many years, we got a little bit too excited, more excited than we should have been. And hopefully everyone else can, can take this and, and chase down these opportunities and chase down the value and make sure that you're actually doing something. And then, of course, there's the competitive advantage and how you actually get into the market. The first question I always like to ask here is what's the miracle count involved, the miracle count? In, if I use a few different examples, most major companies, the successful companies, they only really had one miracle that they needed to experience before they really started gaining momentum. Uh, Google really was about just page ranks, that page ranks were better than these meta tag things. The Apple, resurgence of Apple was just about the craftsmanship around the technology, primarily. Um, Facebook was that exclusivity and the value of exclusivity could translate into the online environment. And the original iteration of Lyft was just that people would trust ride sharing. It's, this is one miracle. But now let's look at our all favorite example here of passenger self-driving cars, courtesy of the media. Thank you if you're in the room, but you can cover other things too. 
So let's count the miracles. So passengers, self-driving cars. Well, first you need to be able to reach human levels of safety. Um, then, which is, you know, that's easy, right? Uh, then regulation and insurance should adapt and they'll adapt in time. And which you know, we're just asking for all the provinces and all 50 odd states and all of the EU to agree on the regulations and insurance structure, which I'm sure is, that's just a side weekend thing. Um, people will then trust and use this service, right? So you're going to also convince you know, in America, the entire American car culture to change, and then we'll be able to work with existing traffic. Right? Oh, and by the way, do that all before you run out of money. Uh, I'm not cynical at all. Uh, but this is a big jump, right? And for a company like Toyota to make this jump, or G GM to, to make this jump, this makes sense. Right? They, this is what they do, and moving along this is it's great, but a startup to do this, when you've got that bottom point here, all before we run out of money, that's a big, that's a really major constraint at this point. Toyota, like the concept of Toyota running out of money or Apple running out of money, that's not really, that's not actually really a concept when it comes to engineering development. That's, Apple just won't, from, <laughs> it just won't, it just won't happen. But a small, a small startup, well, of course. So if you look at, but just even broadly, going outside this, the passenger self-driving car example, one miracle is an ideal space, just waiting for one miracle. Because if you have zero miracles, if you're just talking about rote engineering, then at some point, some MBA in some big company is just going to stumble upon this, in this idea that you've got, and then they're just going to point the company in a little bit in, in a different direction, and then they're going to crush you. Uh, but one miracle means that you're making a jump, you're making a leap of faith that a traditional large bureaucratic company is unable to make. Um, but on the other hand, uh, two or more miracles, odds are you're gonna run out of money or time. In many places it is possible to refactor the problem so that you, you just two miracles could be done, you know, could break it down to the one miracle, but really it's important to know how many things are you relying on changing, like what, how many seismic shifts do you require the world to, to just kind of put at your feet along with starting the startup? And then on top of this, you've got your one miracle identified and you ask what your competitive advantage is. So again, because I seem to love this hand raising thing, uh, how many of you think the user experience, raise your hand if user experience is the best competitive advantage to have? All right, there's a scattering of people. Um, what about your technology intellectual property? You're looking at me like there's a trick question here. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So a little bit more. Obviously, we're all researchers because we hate UX and love IP, but okay, what about team? How about a good team? Team that knows everything that's going on. All right, and data. Is data important? Yes, everyone's putting up their hands. All right, well, so here's the problem is that you don't know. There's so many companies, yeah, you're all wrong. Um, there's so many companies which come into these meetings or they pitch their company and say they have a competitive advantage, but how would they know? They don't have a product, they don't have a market. How do you know that that's your competitive advantage? What you do have, what you might have, is you may have an initial advantage. You may have more capital than the incumbents in the market. That buys you, well, that means you have more money, which is useful, usually. Um, you have more efficiency, that's another thing. If you're a small company, if you're small and agile, you have more efficiency, so it means you can usually do things faster. The same amount of stuff takes less time um, if you're not overburdened by a overabundance of bureaucracy. Or maybe you just have more knowledge, and now this usually saves you a combination of time or money, depending on what sort of markets you're in. If you're a capital-intensive market, well, it might save you time, but it's not gonna save you money. But anyway, these, these are generally the three initial advantages that if you have a startup, you have. You have some, it's, and it's probably the bottom two because rarely do a startups have actually more capital, but sometimes it does happen. So you start with your initial advantage and your idea, but then it's about the refining here. So the obligatory con control, closed loop here. You've got your, your initial advantage and your idea. You take that and then you go through validation you go from validation into your product, your product gets adopted, now your adoption, now you start to see competition. Now your competition doesn't have to be other robotics companies, it could just be the status quo, but you haven't actually worked out where you fit in the market until you've started to compete, until you've started to go forward and get it adopted by more than one people, more than one person and see 
um, cross the proverbial chasm and see what the larger market has to say about this. And only now do you really start to get what your competitive advantage is. And now you can refine and you can build on that if you choose. You can reinforce your competitive advantage or you can rely on it and try to broaden your competitive advantage. There's many strategies here, but the, the key point is that you start with your starting advantage and then over time you get to your competitive advantage. So even if you think your example is your, your team all works well together, you have great technology, well that may be your competitive advantage, but you really don't know. And it's important to know and not lose sight of your starting advantage because it's entirely possible for a startup to lose its starting advantages without actually developing a competitive advantage. And at that point, you're sunk. So let's use, uh, let's use another positive example here. Uh, Kinova for all of the Kinova team in the audience. Uh, Kinova, for those of you who aren't familiar, started with the assistive technology market. And if I get anything wrong, just tell me afterwards. Started with the assistive technology market, did some work in the research market, and now they're expanding further, as you've seen in their booth. Um, but one of the things which is interesting here is the competitive advantage that they've realized is that starting with the assistive technology means that your arms need to be very small, they need to be very safe, they need to be very light. And in 10 years ago or uh, 10 years ago or so, no one cared about that in industry, but now people are caring about this in the, com in the collaborative robotic space. So now they've actually developed some really interesting technology which is applicable in other areas of the market. And I don't think they intended that when they started. They started as a medical company. And then I, the, final, the final example I use is actually our, our example um, of ClearPath Robotics. When we started, we thought that our strongest competitive advantage was going to be the ruggedness of our, of our products. You know, we took a lot of videos shooting outside in the rain and the snow and what have you. And it's true, they, they are still quite rugged, but that's not the main competitive advantage that we have. So, you know, if anyone wants to compete with us, here's the, here's the secret sauce. Um, really, it's about the fact that you can call us up and you can ask us for anything and then we just, we can efficiently deliver it. That's actually what became our competitive advantage, is that it's not about selling the individual black and yellow robots, it's about being, someone being able to call us up and get that full service through through quoting and discovery and understanding what they want, all through delivery and support for years thereafter. And we didn't understand that. We didn't even know that that was going to be the case going into the company. But then over the course of several years, we discovered that this was going to be the case. And it's actually allowed us to stand up relatively well against this constant pressure for hardware price reductions and commoditization. Because that's, that's always going to happen, but really we're not like the, the justification for us isn't that the hardware as much as it's the full, the full perspective. So if I was going to conclude on these points, you're not building robots, you are running a company. Um, so I hope, uh, hope you're good for that, hope you're ready. Um, second, really know where robots fits in your business, where robotics fits in your business. You don't want to lose track of it. You don't want to not be a robotics company because that is actually part of that initial advantage that you have. You're, in, you're all immensely skilled in this particular rapidly growing space, so don't lose that. But at the same time, don't allow it to dominate what you are as a business. And finally, don't just declare your competitive advantage, validate it. Don't be another company that's starting that says we're gonna upend the start self-driving car industry and we're gonna start right now. No, you should probably look for something else because what competitive advantage, like how do you even get there? And in case anyone would like a little bit of, uh, we'll just say follow on reading, here's a few books from our, uh, our company reading list which I think are particularly relevant for anyone who wants to, uh, it's, a, it's a scattering of books, but for anyone who wants to follow up on some of these points, they do align with a lot of the talks or a lot of the points which were brought forward. So um, there's a lot more interesting reads and stories there. All right, I think that's everything I've got. Thank you all for coming to this experiment of ours. So, uh, so thank you again for uh, very exciting talk. Uh, we have some time for questions. Do we have microphones for questions? Somebody uh, has questions? I see. Yeah. 
think there's a microphone there and there. I can't actually see who's got their hands up. So, oh. Hey Ryan, my question is, uh, uh, if you start the company again, are you going to uh, recreate the uh, career path? Pardon? Uh, a question basically is, uh, if you're going to start another robotics company today, what, what's the field you're going to be uh, uh, being? What field would I be in? Yep. I like, um, I like I like fundamental problems, kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs problems. So um, I like uh, farming, construction, infrastructure, power generation. Those areas, I think, are all very fundamental to how we live our lives and are not getting nearly as much investment or attention as they should be. All right. Okay. So I have a question. You showed Apple with their 5.5 million devices, and then they created the App Store. Do you think ClearPass success, like how many uh, platform bases were, have you sold that has led to those services, to those engineering uh, projects that you, you know, you leverage your platform to then solve customers' requirements? Like, is that a, you know, did you you needed that platform, right? So, is there a, is there a number that you guys have, like, you know, critical mass of? <laughs> We need, you know, before our market share got this much, people weren't really coming to us type of thing. Did you experience that? I would say that, so a platform, there's, there's this thing called a platform strategy to product management. And I think it's important to start with the platform strategy internally before you use your platform strategy externally, before, even if you ever go out, out forward beyond that. So to use a hardware example, um, well-tested hardware example, most automotive companies have a platform strategy where they have similar engines and similar drivetrains and that allows them to launch new vehicles very quickly. So that's a platform strategy. Now it's entirely possible for those companies, you know, for certain definitions of the word possible, to actually license other companies to build on that and that would be the hardware equivalent of that platform strategy. And likewise from a software perspective, um, we do have, I mean, we do have people building apps against our, our vehicles, and the important point for us, in particular on the auto side, was to, the autos needed to deliver value on their own first. Right? If they're, they're great, they're driving around, they're, they're safe, they're collecting data, they're doing all this stuff, but you need to make sure that they're there and they're, they're justifying their value before people start building apps on top of it. Because, you know, it's expensive and it takes up time. Um, but I would say, in general, to look, if you're interested in, in the true platform strategy and you do want to be a platform company, look at the, plat in the long term, look at the platform strategies for product management, which means starting internally, using this platform strategy to build up and to increase your efficiency within your corporation, and then from there you can go on. Like, using Apple as the example, they made apps easy to build for their own developers first, and then at a certain point, they said, well, look, they're, easy, they're, they're so easy for our own developers that now we can make the world do that. But they, they use their own developers as beta testers for that, that strategy. So we'll take a question in the, uh, the last two. I had a back question there. over here. Yeah. So um, when you started talking earlier, you mentioned UX and what was the number one uh, part of, I guess, having a competitive advantage. Um, and you listed that first. Um, and then you kind of, I guess, meandered a little bit. So I was kind of wondering, for the success of your company, how much time and, and kind of discovery work did you do as far as UX research? And, and if so, how much did that impact the success of your company? Not as much as I would have liked to do, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also the, one of the things that defines the, uh, like, the function that defines how much time you need to put into UX research also comes into the expectations of the clients and the markets that you're, you're working within. You're, the, generally, your users in, in the market they're in have some sort of expectations. Um, for example, if you are competing, if you're doing computer consumer device, if you're doing con consumer device software, then the bar is set by the Samsungs and Huawei's and, and Apples of the world. So you need to invest a lot in UX to be considered even equivalent. But on the other hand, in manufacturing automation or construction or what have you, for a variety of reasons, you don't need to invest as much in UX. That being said, I think we underinvested at the time. Uh, well, I guess, so my question then is if, so you didn't, you weren't able to, I guess, because of time constraints or client needs, but 
I mean, the basic question then is, how did you know what user expectations were and how to design for that? Well, in the end, in the end, one of the to, and it comes back to the similar question. The markets I really like for robotics are ones where you're solving clear problems, which are just staring you in the face and costing people hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And at that, if you're solving that problem, even in a, even in a somewhat haphazard way, there's time to, to get caught up with some of the things that you don't know. Um, it's not ideal, but prioritization is challenging. Um, on the other hand, if you really, if you're solving a problem which is less valuable, so let's use the, the social robotics example or consumer robotics as an example, you really need to convince people very quickly that you're, you're building a solid product. We may be able to, to chat after. It's, it's really, it's a, it's a prioritization question, but it requires you to know a lot about the market that you're playing in, what their expectations are, what the value you're, you're bringing in. You know, if you're a mining company or construction company and you're saying, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to save you $10 million per, per job site per year, and it's, but it's going to be a really awful user experience, they'll probably have some patience to deal with you on that while you go through the, the challenges. Okay. Thank you. Question in the center there? Yeah. <laughs> well, can you speak loud? <laughs> question was, uh, how do you train for decathlon? <laughs> so I don't actually run that much. Uh, for us, we, we really sought mentorship everywhere, everywhere we possibly could. We recognized the challenges that we were getting into, looked to both get mentorship as well as, as, well as hire mentorship once we were able to, um, to understand what the, the, to better understand that, is, is knowing Basically, assuming that we know nothing, as the states, um, as the statement goes, and actually to that end, my email is at the bottom. So if anyone wants advice on anything like this in the future, feel free to email me. Um, I might take a while to get back to you, but I'll get back to you. Any questions in the front? Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, what should be, according to you, the um, starting point of a company? Is that an ID, a team, or money, or a combination of all of this? Yeah, sorry. Uh, what should be, according to you, the starting point of a company? Yeah, is that an ID, or, or money, or a team? So I would say that it's a little bit of it's a little bit of both, right? Like if you're if you're a bunch of roboticists and a lot of people who are passionate about robotics and expertise in robotics, and as you go through and understand the challenges that your clients need, at a certain point, what's probably going to come back is you're going to come up with a you're going to come up with one of two hypotheses broadly. First is yes, we can solve this with the skills that we have, and the second is no, we probably can't because what they don't need they don't need a robotic they don't need a robot they need a you know, a better cart or a bicycle or something like that. And at that point, you've got to ask yourself a question of, do we go on to a new idea because one that we think we're going to be more passionate about and more skilled to handle, or do we try to develop new skills? Now, if you go back to that, the, one of those very first slides I see I had there, you notice that over time, if you're founding a company, your skills become very, very general. Like the majority of my skills don't actually, the mo majority of my work has nothing to do with robots these days. Um, but at the same time, there's also a matter of your own motivation. This is a you know, 10 plus year endeavor in most cases. You really want to be motivated to do this. And I really like what we're doing. I'm passionate about autonomous systems and it's, it is one of the things that keeps me going. Um, but you do need to look at that. Um, one of the most, one of the more, I think important things to look at from the team is less about um, the particular market and more that there are other general skills and passions which are more broadly applicable than the robotic side. Um, things like sales and operations, marketing, product management, uh, user experience, all of these things, those are actually more generalizable skills. So it's really important to have a team where you can see members of the team maturing into those roles. If we look at the, the three, uh, the, the CEO the, and the COO as, of, of ClearPath, as, long as, my, as well as myself, 
uh, the CEO, he loves sales. Like that's what he does. He just loves to sell and he's very, very good at it. Uh, disturbingly good actually. And uh, the COO, he, I mean, we all went through engineering, but he just really, he loves optimization and, and not in the, not in the MPC type optimization, but in the, you know, give me Excel spreadsheets optimization. Uh, he just loves optimizing processes and uh, processes and systems in general. And because of that, we were able to put, it turns out that you need <laughs> those sorts of people for the business that we're in. But I think that's the more, the, the important thing to look at is that if you're really passionate about this, who do you have who you can work with who's passionate about talking to people and selling these ideas and building an operation and, and building and operationalizing those. Those are most critical, really. And that's gonna be, those, those sorts of roles is gonna be true no matter what idea you end up doing. So we have uh, time for just two more questions. So one here and then one there. Go ahead. Thank you for the presentation, Ryan. Uh, I come from a medical robotics background. So my what with the, with the rise of artificial intelligence and reinforcement learning and everything in the other realms of robotics, do you see there is a part that could, that these technologies would play in medical robotics because essentially they're sort of a black box to a certain extent and you, you, you need actual clinical and model validation in order to certify the medical product. Do you see that this is going to play a role in medical robotics in the future? Thank you. I'm reminded of a, uh, I'm a re reminded of a statement in a table in the uh, IEC 61508 uh, industrial safety standard where when they talk about adaptive systems and self-learning systems, it basically says don't ever use these. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's on page like 400 and something. Um, what I would say for medical robotics is that I do think that despite where we are right now, I do think that over time, like in the fullness of time, we will solve the certifiability and the introspectability of these current black box approaches. And what I would encourage from a medical device standpoint is to really watch the progress in autonomous on-road passenger cars because I think, and, on, on, and autonomous on-road transport trucks, because I think those cases you really, for those to be valid and they're pouring billions of dollars in that, they really need to track the certification problem and introspection problem on those architectures. So I think it's gonna be very important to look at where theirs goes, you know, things like where uh, ISO 26262, how that changes over time because right now it basically assumes you need to have analytical completeness and verifiability in this full V model software development, which isn't really possible. But I think over the next five to 10 years, we'll start to see a shift of, of that. And if you're in the audience and you're, um, and you're working on that sort of thing, then thank you because I really hate certification work. Um, All right, last question. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. I remember seeing in your slides that you had, uh, in the slide where you mentioned about the, uh, the breakup of a robotics company, that the, uh, on, the, on the right you had the developers and on the left you had the management and the sales and everything else. Um, my question is about the sales and the marketing part. WhatsApp, it started in, um, without a big marketing, com uh, marketing department or, uh, or a sales team and it just was still able to scale up. So my question is, is it, do you think that it is possible for a robotics company to do that? I mean, everything's, everything's possible, right? <laughs> um, I mean, WhatsApp is certainly on the, the long tail of long tails. They sold for freakish amounts of money which, with having a very small amount of people. That's why I think focus, focus is very important, but there's, there's two challenges here that you've got to face up to with a robotics company. If you're a B2C robotics company, your consumer goods probably looked at consumer goods or a toy, which means that you've got to go through distribution channels, you've got to understand distribution channels and marketing and things like that. And if you're a B2B robotics company, your industrial equipment, which means enterprise sales, which is very expensive. So I think if, if you're selling directly to end users, which is the way to have the most control of your destiny, then you're going to need a sales and marketing team, sales marketing team of some sort. Um, it, it may be possible, we're seeing the emergence right now, starting to see a emergence of companies who are selling to other robotics and AI companies and it actually makes sense for them to do so. Um, but I still think we're a little bit early days on that. You won't need as many sales and marketing people there, but I think even there, there's still a need for sales and marketing. Thank you so much. And sales and marketing isn't a bad thing, right? It actually makes your life easier. <laughs> With that, we'll conclude. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone.